evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Vice Admiral Lawrence Ethics Essay Award Dinner. My name is Colonel Art Athens, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the director of the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership here at the Naval Academy. Your presence here this evening is a testament to the Academy's commitment to ethical leadership, to living that way and to developing those who will go out and lead our sailors and Marines. And this is an opportunity to fellowship with one another and also to renew our own commitment to integrity and to honor. It's now my distinct privilege to introduce the 61st Superintendent of the Naval Academy. Admiral Miller is a 1974 graduate of the Academy and has made significant contributions to the Navy and the nation in high visibility and very demanding assignments. These assignments included Commander Carrier Strike Group 7, the first active duty director of the White House Military Office, commanding officer USS John F. Kennedy, commanding officer USS Coronado, third fleet flagship, squadron commanding officer during Desert Shield and Desert Storm. Prior to assuming his current position, Admiral Miller served as the Navy's chief of legislative affairs. As a superintendent, Admiral Miller has provided energy, enthusiasm, and engagement and propelled the Academy forward on a productive and impressive trajectory. Please join me in welcoming Admiral Miller and his wife, Barbara, who joins us this evening as well. Admiral Miller. Thank you, Art, for that kind in, uh, introduction. Uh, I really do pay Art to say that stuff about me. So, um, you know, we're, we are blessed tonight uh, to be able to, to share this evening with so many special friends. And I will start by, uh, by honoring a guest that's uh, just here in town for just a couple of days to see what we do here at the Naval Academy. Admiral Ribeiro and his wife Lourdes uh, is the superintendent of the Portuguese Naval Academy. They're joined here by uh, 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 Captain uh, Roque, uh, and I, I think Colonel Silva might have bailed out on me here, but we have the Portuguese here in force, and uh, Admiral, it's a pleasure to have you here. Of course, uh, Admiral Bill Burke and Mary here, uh, seated next to Barbara, uh, a very dear friend, and we're honored to welcome him back to the Naval Academy, uh, someone who has certainly epitomized the ethical leadership that we ha hope to imbue in all of our midshipmen. You know, it's kind of, uh, it, for me, it's, it's always a little bit humbling because there are so many people in this room who know so much more about the ethical development of our brigade than I, because they have seen so much more. Uh, the, and the person that, that I would highlight, uh, the, the wife of the namesake for this dinner, uh, Mrs. Diane Lawrence, and here with Dr. Uh, Lori Lawrence, uh, has, has been, for, for Barbara and I, someone who could help us see in so many ways, the, the many dimensions of the development of the midshipmen here. There is no one who is a more staunch advocate for the Naval Academy. There's no one whose uh, friendship we treasure more, no one who bleeds blue and gold deeper than we. So Diane and Lori, thank you for being here today. Of course, uh, it's, it is well known here in, uh, at the Naval Academy that Vice Admiral Bill Lawrence uh, set the standard for integrity uh, during his time as a naval aviator, certainly for his many years as a prisoner of war in Vietnam. Uh, his time coming back here to be as a superintendent, to pay it forward, to be the person who would be larger than life right outside our own, uh, the Wesley Brown Center. Uh, you can, you, you know, he was an accomplished poet. There were so many things that he did so well. And such is the case for the many people that are here tonight. I would uh, highlight the class of 81 that is so generous, has so generously supported this dinner. I, uh, you know, the, we have just uh, commissioned the USS William P. Lawrence and uh, the motto would not surprise any of you all. It's uh, never give in. Uh, certainly what Admiral Lawrence lived uh, as, as a great representative of this institution. It's not the only USS Lawrence, of course, that the, Naval, uh, that the Navy has, has had. In point of fact, tomorrow marks the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Lake Erie. And it was on that battle where, where Oliver Hazard Perry 
uh, defeated the British, reestablished our northern borders, which exist to this day, and where, uh, where he honored his friend, the, uh, the fallen Captain James Lawrence, who had died earlier in the year in a battle just outside of Boston at sea. Uh, when uh, when James Captain James Lawrence went down with the ship, or I should say, when he was defeated, his his, last, his dying words were, "Fight her till she sinks, and don't give up the ship." That pennant uh, flew aboard the uh, the flagship for Oliver Hazard Perry, the Lawrence, until she was pretty much beaten up by HMS uh, Detroit. But when the day was finally carried, he transferred his flag back to the badly beaten uh, USS Lawrence to accept the British surrender. And it is from there that he sent his famous message, we have met the enemy and they are ours. Tonight we talk about the moral courage of our midshipmen, of the, the student body here that must represent the finest attributes of honor and trust and commitment. I would hope that as we uh, celebrate tonight, you all get a chance to know the people that are seated at, at your table because they all have a hand in this very, very detailed approach that is unique to the Naval Academy, I would offer. Uh, and for that very reason, I, specifically because this is a product, and you'll hear more about it, I think, a little later, but our NE203 course, the Ethics and Moral Reasoning for the Naval Officer, this is where these essays are produced by our sophomores, and I would ask that all of the professors for that particular course stand and be recognized. There's Rick, come on. Of course, we, uh, we honor our two award winners, but in point of fact, we had finalists, we have, and we have very, very strong competition across the, the brigade. People take this seriously, and, and, and as well they should. It is truly what will propel them, the foundation on which they stand, and ultimately the jets that will propel them to heights that even they cannot fully appreciate. I'm, uh, I'm such a big fan of this particular event and this evening. I'm, s I'm so impressed with the essays that have been written by our midshipmen. They show a maturity and a level of insight that quite frankly I did not possess when I was your age. And I, I sincerely thank you for it and I am so grateful for everyone's attendance tonight. Thank you very much. Well, Admiral Miller, thank you. And your historical perspective that you always add means so much, and I think it's so important to always put these kind of events in context, the larger context. And I always feel like the Marines always talk about their history, but Admiral Miller always brings that Navy history that's just as rich and just as old, and I guess as the Chief of Staff would tell me, even older than the Marine Corps, but we debate that on a daily uh, basis. Uh, before we would eat, um, I, I also just want to say thank you to the class of 81 who, who sponsors this, uh, this dinner. And just if we could have all the members of the class of, of 81 stand as well, that we could recognize you and, and thank you for your generosity to allow this uh, dinner to occur. So anybody from the class of 81. Thank you. And since I'm of the class of 1978, I'm sure I never, ever yelled at any of you who happen to be in here uh, this evening. Uh, I also want to thank the superintendent's protocol staff, because they normally depart, and they're probably already gone already. But, but I'm going to mention them anyway, because they're moving on to the next event that has to be planned and, and executed. But Janet Price and Ann McConnell and Tina Gorka, they handle all the RSVPs, the seating, and so much more, and, and in their absence, I would like to give them a, a round of applause as well. They do a great job. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I, I'd like to recognize a couple of individuals. I know, I, know, I know you are all special, and you all deserve to be recognized, so that's a starting point, but, but there's a couple of people that um, I, I, wa I want to mention. First, I want to uh, add my welcome to our friends from Portugal. Uh, I've, as a Marine, I've done a number of NATO exercises uh, in, in Portugal, and 
always enjoyed the hospitality there, so we're, we're glad you could, you could be with us. There's a number of members of, the, of Admiral Miller's senior leadership team here. I'm not going to introduce them uh, individually, but I was going to recognize the Commandant and his wife uh, because this is their first Ethics Essay Award dinner, right? The, you, you're that brand new that this is your, this is your first one. But uh, Captain Byrne and his, his wife, Amy, just welcoming them to the Ethics Essay Award dinner. And thank you for the ethical leadership that you are providing the brigade, Bill. We, we do appreciate it. I also want to recognize the, the new Stockdale Center Deputy Director, uh, Lieutenant Commander Jason Briannis. He's been at work for exactly 12 hours. Uh, he, he came today and he was thrust immediately into, uh, into his role. He's coming from the USS Theodore Roosevelt. And Jason, are you, are you here? He's in the very back. And I do want to echo Admiral Miller's comments of, of welcome to Mrs. Lawrence, who always adds grace and dignity to our, to our dinner. We thank you for what you represent and the wonderful relationship with Admiral Lawrence that's a model for all of us who are, who are married. So thank you again for, for being here. So now it's my honor to introduce the, uh, the guest speaker. So Vice Admiral Bill Burke and I are, are classmates. And we first met, we were in the same Protramid cohort, which means you travel to see the different parts of the Navy and Marine Corps. So we were together uh, during the summer of 1976, and we went to New London together, we went to Norfolk together, we went to Quantico together, and we went to Pensacola together. And I was hesitating whether I was going to tell this story, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it because there were about five of us who, who spent our liberty time to, together, and I was in that group with, with Bill. He was a baseball player, and when we were in Norfolk, they had a carnival that was ongoing at Virginia Beach, so like good midshipmen on liberty, we went down to the, to the carnival. And if you've ever seen at the carnival where they have these little clowns that have the fuzz on the outside, and they're lined up like three rows, but they're weighted, so it's very, very difficult to knock these things down. But doggone it, Bill Burke, he took these baseballs and just rocketed them at these, at these clowns, knocked them down, and won this, this stuffed animal. Of course, none of us had any, any companions to give this stuffed animal to, so Admiral Burke had to walk around with that. But the best part was there was a recruited basketball player who was also in our group. And there's also those basketball hoops at the carnival where the ball's too small and the rim's too small. And he so badly wanted to win an, admi uh, an animal because Admiral Burke had won one, but to no avail because he did not. And I thought baseball showed its triumph over basketball that night. All right. So while I was there, besides the baseball piece, I gained a great respect for Admiral Burke's professionalism, his integrity, his altruism, and everything about him. And all of us who were in that group, beyond just the five that went on Liberty together, knew that this was someone special who would make his mark on the Navy, which he definitely has. He's had his contributions at sea and, and on shore and include command of the USS Toledo SSN 769 and Submarine Squadron 2. He's been the Assistant Deputy Director for Combating Terrorism on the Joint Staff, the Executive Assistant to the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, the Commander of Logistics Group Western Pacific, the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Fleet Readiness and Logistics, and Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Systems. But to me, most importantly, he has executed his responsibilities and led others with uncompromising integrity. He is known as an ethical leader, and finished his journey well as a Navy officer, retiring in May of this year. Now, before I bring Admiral Burke up here, I would like to recognize his wife, Mary, because she has been that, that stronghold, that foundation for the family, while Bill has been deployed numerous times, worked, I'm sure, very late hours everywhere he's gone, 
and I think it's worth our while to just thank Mary for her service to the nation and what she's done during Admiral Burke's career. So if we could just give a hand to Mary. So now, please join me in welcoming Admiral Bill Burke, baseball thrower extraordinaire. <laughs> well, good evening. Art, thank you for that too kind introduction. I'm pleased to be here this evening with my wife, Mary, and also our son, Will, who's the new 25th company officer, and his fiance, Natalie Golden. <clears throat> so, so thank you for feeding the Burke family tonight. <laughs> Before I begin, let me acknowledge my friend, the soup, Mike Miller, and uh, his wife, Barbara. They do such a great job here. Um, I'd also like to make note of our guests from Portugal. Thank you for being here. And uh, Bill Byrne, new commandant, and his wife, uh, Amy. This is my first, first ethics uh, dinner, too, Bill. <laughs> <coughs> and then uh, from 81, Mike Manazer and Jim Shannon, a couple of my friends from uh, who used to be plebes. Thank you for being here, and thank you for sponsoring this. And Mrs. Lawrence, thank you for being here tonight. Your presence reminds us of the legacy you and your husband established here at the Academy. Uh, thank you to Colonel Art Athens for asking me to speak tonight, despite our history together. <laughs> you see, I bailed on, out on going Marine Corps 35 years ago. Art and I had agreed that Marine Corps was the right path during pro tramid but later I changed my mind. I'm happy it worked out so well for both of us. <laughs> and Art, thanks for not holding it against me. For the midshipmen in the audience, I can think of no better role model than Art Athens. Art was our brigade commander, a good student, lacrosse team goalie, and a wonderful person and friend who had a super superb career in the Marine Corps. Art, thanks for inviting our classmates. I know Byron Marchant, Terry O'Brien, and John Rutter were um, supposed to be here. I think they may be. I know I saw John, but I think it was a good move to seat them at different tables. <laughs> I'm also delighted to see General John Sattler here and his wife, Ginny. Uh, not once, but twice, I had the opportunity and the good fortune to work for General Sattler, once on Capitol Hill and once again on the Joint Staff. I've never worked for a more inspirational leader. It is no surprise to me <coughs> that U.S. and coalition forces responded so well to his leadership in Operation Iraqi Freedom. I am most appreciative of what you, Art, and the new guy here, 12 Hours, and uh, General Sattler, and your entire ethics team are doing for our, for our alma mater. So thank you for that. Most important, let me acknowledge the midshipmen here tonight. You are the reason we have gathered. Most of you would probably rather not be here. You might prefer to be studying or watching the Skins and the Eagles, the Yanks and the Orioles, or the U.S. Open Tennis Final, or being on Liberty. I don't know, is there Monday Night Liberty, Mike? Doesn't, doesn't mean you might not rather be there. <laughs> now, don't worry about the length of my talk, because as Henry VIII said to each of his six wives, I shall not keep you long. <laughs> In preparation for my talk, I reviewed several references, including the Navy ethos, the Navy core charter, core value charter, Navy ethics training, searched Google, read a few books, and thought all the way back to my junior officer days. Additionally, I read some of your papers, which address the subjects of intervention in Syria, targeted killings, cyberspace, legitimate authority, and military service. 
I was favorably impressed by the quality of your papers. They captured the issues very well. Congratulations to each of you on your work. However, I was struck by the gulf between the topics of your papers and the ethical issues encountered daily by the U.S. Navy. The topics in your papers are of the level of gravity that General Sattler would have dealt with when he was heading up the Joint Staff Plans and Policy Directorate. Position papers such as yours would have been built by his team of 05s and 06s and junior flag and general officers that General Sattler would have then taken to the White House for deputies committee meetings. Now you might ask what are the ethical issues the Navy deals with daily? Certainly our frontline engaged forces implement the policy decisions made on topics like those of your papers. In fact, as you know, our forces are standing by to execute strikes on Syria. But more frequently, we deal with sexual assault, sexual harassment, driving under the influence, drug use, suicide, inappropriate relationships, improper hiring practices, and felonious contracting violations. At first glance, you may say these are simply examples of bad behavior. You'd be correct. However, failure of basic ethical principles under, underpins each of these problems. The examples are cases of giving in to moral temptation, which is sometimes called right versus wrong ethics. According to Rush, <coughs> Rushworth Kidder in How Good People Make Tough Choices, there are three ways to be wrong. One can violate the law, depart from the truth, or deviate from moral rectitude. Additionally, the identified examples are what you are much more likely to address in your Navy or Marine career. In fact, you don't need to become an officer to confront these issues. Midshipmen confront many of these right versus wrong issues daily. But it is imperative that you get the day-to-day -day or right versus wrong correct or you will not be part of the discussion on the important topics like those of your papers. Again, from Rushworth Kidder, the really tough choices don't center upon right versus wrong. They involve right versus right. They are genuine dilemmas because each side is firmly rooted in one of our basic core values. Four such dilemmas are so common to our experience that they stand as models, patterns, or paradigms. They are truth versus loyalty, individual versus community, short-term versus long-term, and justice versus mercy. Now, another author helped me make the distinction between the sexy topics of your papers and the reality of day-to-day -day Navy issues. He broke down ethics into three categories. First is personal ethics, those characteristics we, we expect of one another. Second is professional ethics, which includes standards of behavior or codes of conduct associated with a particular field. Third is global ethics, excuse me, global ethics, which is most, which most would agree is the most controversial and least understood ethical area. It is open to interpretation as to how or whether ethical considerations should be applied. Heated debate and emotional responses are the norm. Accordingly, it is not surprising that this was the subject of your writing assignment. For the most part, day-to-day -day issues fall into the personal and professional ethics categories. I hope I will not disappoint you tonight when I tell you the third area, global ethics, is not the top topic of my talk this evening. Rather, I will focus more on the personal and professional ethics because you will confront these issues as a midshipman and as a junior officer. 
Now, what are personal and professional ethics? Personal ethics includes concern for the well-being of others, respect for their autonomy, trustworthiness and honesty, legal compliance, being fair and just, refusing to take unfair advantage, and generally doing good and preventing harm. Professional ethics includes impartiality or objectivity, openness, transparency or full disclosure, confidentiality, due diligence, fidelity to professional responsibilities, and avoiding apparent conflict of interest. One might think that once you graduate from the academy, you have what it takes to be an ethical officer in person. But listening to your inner voice is a lifelong challenge. The number of commanding officer firings has been higher for the last few years. Reasons generally are found in four categories. Untoward incidents, incompetence, inability to deal with stress, and misbehavior. Misbehavior, including DUI or an adulterous affair, are far more likely than the other categories of firings. By the way, these are also some of the reasons for junior officer firings. Flag officers participate in hours of personal and professional ethics discussions, yet we continue to hear about admirals and generals being investigated for misconduct. So much so that the staff of the Navy Inspector General has been increased to address the growing number of investigations. Now, specific ethics guidance comes in two forms. One is the Navy ethos developed by Admiral Greenert and his staff when he was commander of the Fleet Forces Command. The second is the Department of the Navy core values of honor, courage, and commitment. I'd like to delve into the core values charter because I think it is particularly value, valuable in its simplicity. Let's break down honor, courage, and commitment. First, honor, which states, I am accountable for my personal and professional behavior. I will be mindful of the privilege I have to serve my fellow Americans. I will abide by an uncompromising code of integrity, taking full responsibility for my actions. I will conduct myself in the highest ethical manner. I will be honest and truthful. I will make honest recommendations and seek honest recommendations from junior personnel. I will encourage new ideas, and I will fulfill my legal and ethical responsibilities. Now, there's quite a bit of substance in that. Most people read honor and say, I know what that means, and read no further. The greater detail gives more context and therefore is more useful to our understanding. When I think of the core value of honor, I think, listen to your inner voice. If you don't have an inner voice, you better get one, because you will need it as, as an adult, regardless of your profession or place of employment. Now, how, how does the use of raunchy videos by an XO stack up against this core value? How does sexual assault stand up to conducting oneself in the highest ethical manner? A specific personal example came during a Hong Kong port visit when I was a junior officer. I purchased a rug, which I sent back to Hawaii in a duty-free status. In the store, a person asked me to ship some goods for him in the same duty-free status available to me, but not to him. He also offered to compensate me for my trouble. No one would have known except the two of us. Agreeing would have been tantamount to stealing revenue from the government. It was an easy choice, like many right versus wrong situations. I knew it did not feel right because, my inner, because of my inner voice and acted accordingly. Courage, the second core value, is stated as the value which gives me moral and mental strength to do what is right with confidence and resolution, even in the face of temptation and adversity. 
I will have the courage to meet the demands of my profession. I will make decisions and act in the best interest of the Department of the Navy and the nation without regard to personal consequences. I will overcome all challenges while adhering to the highest standards of personal conduct and decency. I will be loyal to the nation by ensuring the resources entrusted to me are used in an honest, careful, and efficient way. Once again, I think the greater detail provides useful context. When I consider courage as a core value, I think do the right thing. Situations you are likely, in, likely to encounter as a junior officer are a watchstander falling asleep, improperly completing logs, or falsifying documents. Frequently in these situations, only you and the watchstander know the truth. How you respond will define your tour. Two personal examples follow. First, while attending my 10th high school reunion, which sounds like an awful long time ago, considering my 35th Naval Academy reunion is this weekend, um, <clears throat> my wife and I are en route an after party at a friend's house. While walking toward the door, we both smelled marijuana. It would have been easy to continue in and enjoy the friends I had not seen for 10 years while not smoking marijuana, but my presence would have meant that I condoned its use. We turned and left. A second, more complex example occurred during my tour as Commander of Logistics Group Western Pacific in Singapore, where I was also the regional commander. The CNO had just issued direction outlawing prostitution. The associated transnational issue of trafficking in persons was receiving great attention by the U.S. government under Department of State lead. A building in Singapore called Orchard Towers contained numerous bars, lounges, and shops. The building was well known in Westpac as Four Floors of Whores. When a ship came to Singapore, many sailors and Marines could be found here, among other patrons. One evening when Navy ships were in, Mary and I, along with the U.S. Ambassador and some of her staff, the Navy Criminal Investigative Service, including the lead NCIS agent, and the local police went to Orchard Towers to see for ourselves. The NCIS and local police were unequivocal in saying prostitution occurred here. They also knew many of the women were a product of trafficking in persons and were from many of the Southeast Asian nations. It was obvious to me that I would take the necessary steps to declare Orchard Towers off limits. But I encountered strong pushback from other professionals. NCIS said the concentration of sailors and Marines at Orchard Towers made it easier for them to ensure the sailors and Marines did not get into trouble elsewhere. <laughs> Embassy personnel were not interested in the off-limits designation because only recently had Singapore been upgraded in trafficking and this would give Singapore a black eye. I got great guidance from my boss, the 7th Fleet Commander, Admiral Greener, who told me, do what you think is right. I also received private support from the ambassador, but not from her team. To me, this was an obvious decision that turned out to be not so easy, partly because a right versus right issue was involved. The two competing rights were honesty to ourselves and loyalty to the host nation. Now, finally, commitment states the day-to-day -day duty of every man and woman in the Department of the Navy is to join together as a team to improve the quality of our work, our people, and ourselves. I will foster respect up and down the chain of command. I will care for the personal and spiritual well-being of our people. I will show respect toward all people without regard for race, religion, or gender. 
I will always strive for positive change and personal improvement. I will exhibit the highest degree of moral character, professional excellence, and competence in all that I do. I sum this one up as trust, excuse me, treat people as you would like to be treated. And I think the greater detail, again, provides context we might not simply get from the word commitment. Now, it is alleged that some junior officers purposefully fail out of a program because it is not their first choice of assignment. Purposely failing out does not fit with this core value. When you reach the fleet, you will find many junior people in your divisions have challenging personal situations that make it difficult for them to spend <coughs> their earnings frugally and wisely. Such situations preclude these sailors and Marines from concentrating and doing their best work. They will need your help and you will see that there was no one else to help. The challenge will be, do you give them the necessary help because you will be extremely busy with your work? But remember, they are part of your work. Now I have a personal example of a yeoman who worked for me whose fiscal irresponsibility was about to cause him clearance problems. I offered him help and periodic monitoring, <coughs> which allowed him to overcome his fiscal challenges, retain his clearance, and later buy a house. I did little other than point the way, but he is a better sailor and forever grateful. I have attempted to recast honor, courage, and commitment as listen to your inner voice, do the right thing, and treat people as you would like to be treated. Well, I think the recasting can help. Reading and understanding the core value charter will be valuable to you both here at the Naval Academy and in the fleet because the detail will allow you to address the wide range of circumstances that require more guidance than concern for others or does it feel right. Ultimately, character is character, and you will be judged on your character. Do well in the right versus wrong ethics of your personal and professional lives, and you will find the opportunity to address the right versus right issues of global ethics issues like you have done so well in your papers. Thank you for your time and attention. So at the Stockdale Center, we have a compass that we like to say is the moral compass that uh, is engraved with the uh, Stockdale Center uh, words. And we're going to present this to uh, Admiral Burke, knowing that he will keep this on his desk. And no matter where he goes, what organization is going to be fortunate to gain him next, that they're going to have a person certainly with a strong and steadfast moral compass. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Before we proceed to the awards, I, I want to emphasize that the accomplishments of these students would not be possible without the diligent effort of those who design the moral reasoning course, administer the course, and teach the course. Admiral Miller has already recognized those who teach in the NE203. I'd like to specifically recognize a, a colleague, a friend, and someone who has poured his life literally into this course and to the well-being of midshipmen, the course director, Captain Rick Rubel, over there. And this event also gives me an opportunity to introduce to this audience our new distinguished chair in ethics, uh, who's coming to us from Georgetown University, splits his time between Georgetown and, and us, and, and that's uh, Dr. David Luban from Georgetown right there with his wife, Judith.
We are very fortunate to have someone of Dr. Luban's caliber who's joining with us and investing in the lives, not just of midshipmen, but staff and faculty as well. So we, we really are grateful that you're, you're on board. We also have three resident fellows, and this is the one chance to, to recognize them and introduce them again to this audience. These resident fellows come from other universities and spend a year focused on a research topic that benefits not only the Naval Academy, but also the Navy and Marine Corps and really our broader Department of Defense. This year they're going to be studying comparative warfare ethics, looking at the ethics of those that are our friends and allies and those that are our potential enemies to see how we think a little bit different about ethics and how do we bring those together with our allies and how do we understand the enemy that we might have to someday fight. So the first of those resident fellows is Dr. Scott Davis from the University of Richmond. Right there, good to see you. Then we have Dr. Joseph Capizzi from the Catholic University of America with his wife, Mary. And Dr. Jesse Kirkpatrick coming to the Academy from the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab and his wife, Valerie. So now to the awards. Um, every semester, which is two semesters here at the Naval Academy, students write essays within this NE203 Moral Reasoning course. What occurs at that point is, is that the instructors in the class pick out those that are the best, and then they are then screened by members of the faculty of the Department of Leadership, Ethics, and Law here at the Naval Academy. We then receive um, somewhere between five and seven papers at the Stockdale Center, and we then engage some outside readers to be the final arbiters of the rankings of those papers and who will receive the, the awards. Our outside readers this year were Ms. Joy Arview, the Director of Ethics and Business Conduct from Boeing Defense, Space, and Security. Joy, she's down at the end there. Our second reader was Ms. Courtney Wallis, Corporate Director, Ethics and Business Conduct from Northrop Grumman Corporation. Right there. And our, th our third reader who could not join us tonight was Vice Admiral Phil Wisecup, who's the Naval Inspector General. So he also helped with this process. They take this very serious. They spend a lot of their own personal time to do these rankings to send them back to us. Now I'm going to ask Admiral Miller and Admiral Burke if they would come up for the presentations of, of the awards. I'm going to read the full letter that goes to each of these awardees. Uh, and then after the initial first letter, I'm just going to mention the title of their paper and their, and their name, and then we'll recognize the, uh, the award winner, the, the, the top award winner for each of the two semesters. We have one for the fall and one for the spring. So we will start with the fall semester, which would have been last fall when they took this, when they took this course, and this is the letter that they all received. From the Director, Vice Admiral Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership, letter of commendation. I commend you for your outstanding contribution to the ethics essay competition with your paper, and this is Midshipman Joshua Babb. The paper, Ethical Basics for the Legitimacy of States and Substate Paramilitaries. Your paper was selected by a panel of distinguished experts as a finalist from a field of over 400 entries submitted by students in any 203 during the spring 2013 semester. Your achievement is a testament to both your academic ability and understanding of the ethical implications of service in the United States Navy and Marine Corps. I applaud your commitment to excellence and appreciate your drive to prepare yourself morally and mentally to be an effective leader. Congratulations and best wishes in all your future endeavors. So second, second class, Bab, if you would come up, we're going to give you your certificate. You're going to get a picture. You'll be in between the two admirals, and you'll be holding your certificate. And there's the photographer. <laughs> Tell we've done this before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
The next finalist is midshipman second class Andrew Jones. The paper was Ethics in the Cyber Domain. Second class Jones. Okay. What were those options, Admiral Burke, that they, uh, okay, that, he, he took you, he took you up on that one. There aren't any Redskins fans that are worried about the time, are there, because, anyway. The next finalist was Midshipman sec Second Class Ashton McCombs, and the title of the essay was Establishing Legitimate Authority, Second Class McCombs. Another finalist, Midshipman Second Class Kyle Waldorf for the paper Ethics in Military Service. Second Class Waldorf. Before I, I announce the, uh, the, the winner, uh, they get a book that's a fantastic book called The Tennessee Patriot, uh, which is about the naval career of Vice Admiral Lawrence. They get a plaque, but they also get money. But I'm not even going to tell you how much it is, but there's a check for the finalists in their package here. But again, it's a book, a plaque and a nice check to be able to spend on that liberty that Admiral Burke was, was talking about. And midshipman second class Andrew Sullivan was the, uh, was the recipient, and the title of the paper was Extending the Aim Arm of War, an Ethical Examination of Targeted Killing. And this is now for the spring semester, which would have been completed this, uh, this past spring. Midship, midshipman Second Class Ian Eversman for the uh, paper, The Syrian Dilemma, an application of just war theory to modern humanitarian intervention. And right after he receives this, he's going to be going to the White House to help with the speech <laughs> that's going to be given uh, to tomorrow. This is midshipman second class John McAuliffe for the paper Intervention in Syria, also going to the White House after this is over. Midshipman McAuliffe. Midshipman Second Class Michael Segala and his paper, The Ethics of Targeted Killing. Midshipman Segala. And this is our winner for the uh, spring semester. Again, the same book, plaque, and check. Uh, and this is midshipman second class Brian Mahalovich. And the paper was Cyberspace and Civilians. How are the two interconnected?
So to wrap it up, I, I'd like to thank my staff and highlight two individuals, Ms. Marge Bem and Ms. Jacqueline Dana, who were instrumental in making this evening happening. So I don't know where Marge and Jacqueline are. I know Jacqueline's in the back. I see his Marge back there. Okay, thank you so much for all that you do. And as we depart tonight, I'd like to leave us with a final thought. Uh, I recently read the book called Lessons from the Hanoi Hilton that recounts the heroics of those who served as POWs in the North Vietnamese prison camp nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton, the place where Admiral Lawrence spent his captivity. The book goes on to highlight why these individuals were so resilient in captivity and so successful upon their return. The book points out that one of the keys for these POWs was a clear vision of their desired end state. The POWs by agreement concluded that their overriding objective was the phrase, return with honor. Not just return home from North Vietnam, but return with their honor intact. This was their daily theme, their internal mantra, the picture that they had in their mind when they faced the most trying of circumstances. As I considered this vision of these brave and extraordinary men, I wondered, what is our vision for life, all of us? How do we picture our end state, our life objective? Is our vision to live with honor? Do we want to be remembered above all for our integrity? Is this the legacy we want to leave? If live with honor is not our vision, perhaps it should be. So my hope and prayer tonight is that we would walk away from this evening with a clear vision to live with honor and a commitment to make this our legacy. And I believe that Admiral Lawrence would applaud such a vision and such a commitment because that's what he was about. And we have the opportunity to do the same in our own circumstances, to have that kind of end state, to live with honor. Thank you for being with us tonight, honoring these midshipmen that are with us, and for all you do on a daily basis. So good night, and God bless you. <laughs>